Welcome to the island tour. This first stop, this is the airport control tower. Sitting in the left seat is the air boss. Air boss is in charge of the entire air department, which doesn't mean the squadrons and the pilots. It means the people working the flight deck, the people working the hangar deck, the ones that shoot the planes off the front and catch them on the back, uh, refuel the aircraft, and tie the aircraft down, and so forth and so on. Airbus and Mini are both about 36 years old at this stage in their career, been in the Navy about 15 years at this point. They're both fixed wing tail hook squadron commanders, uh, and now they work for the USS Midway. The story of the Mini is kind of an interesting story. Way back when they started flying Navy planes in the late 1930s, before World War II, all small towns had a movie theater. Nobody had any television, there wasn't any. And so you'd go to the movie theater and uh, 14 cents, my movie theater was 14 cents, and you get a cartoon and a newsreel and then a movie. And the most popular cartoon was Mickey and Minnie. So that's how the number two became Minnie. Okay, this board here is our flight status board. Uh, on Midway, we would have a 12 hour flying schedule in my day. The flight schedule is written the evening before, and it would be put on the board as we move through the time. You can see in the upper left, we're going to be launching aircraft at 0800, and a little later in the morning, we're going to be launching the team going out at 0930. The minute we launch the 0930 team, we'll bring back down the 0800 team, and that'll be called the flying cycle. Along those desks there, our off-duty pilots from the squadron, if you pick up those desks and look inside, you'll see our owner's manual for each of the type of airplanes we're flying. When the pilots go flying up in the sky, they don't have room in the cockpit for the big three-ring binder, so they have it here. And if they have a problem in the sky, they'll call their boss. Air boss will ask one of the pilots, look up the problem and try to come up with the right, right answer. Over here, we have another uh, uh, airmen here, this is very important. Uh, in the early days of Navy landings, we had the, the uh, landing signal officer with paddles and he would mimic what the aircraft is doing and then when it got close to the deck, he'd say, cut the engine. Uh, when jets came, that wouldn't work, so they, they came up with a convex funhouse mirror 
with a big red ball shining in the middle. And quickly the pilots nicknamed that the meatball, and then later it got shortened to the ball. Then we got faster and faster jets, we had to come up with a better system. So this is the console that controls the Fresnel lens, which is on the far side of the flight deck. And the Fresnel lens has five traffic lights cut in a Fresnel system. So when you're back of the ship, you only see one of the traffic lights. If you're too high, you see the high one. If you're too low, you see the low one. What you want to see is the one in the middle. And they set this to neutral based on the type of airplane. We have different style airplanes and models out there. Some are long and skinny, some are short and stubby. And so what we're adjusting here is the eyeball to the tail hook distance. Pilot's eyeballs are up here in the cockpit. His tail hook is way back down here. The difference could be anywhere from 15 to 25 feet. So we're setting that in here based on the model of the aircraft. Over here we have another technician setting, or monitoring, I'm sorry, not setting, what's going on down in the arresting cable rooms. In the arresting cable rooms we have giant hydraulic pistons which let the block and tackle and the cross deck pennant run out at a nice even rate for 340 feet. However, if you look at the deck, we have skinny little airplanes that weigh 14,000 pounds, and we've got big guys, the one on the back end there, her call sign was the whale, coming in at 49,000 pounds. So we got to know who's coming to make sure we're ready for the arresting cable. Okay, the door just opened. We're going to leave here now. This is the first time we're going to be going down a Navy ladder, so put the children behind you, please, on the way down. charts is to understand what's under the water. We were down 36 feet in the water. We wanted to make sure we weren't going to run aground. Now the first time we use a Navy chart, we draw a track line. Look on each of the charts in front of you and you'll see an ink line that's starting at the outer sea buoy and running all the way into the port. The other thing that makes a Navy chart work is something called the compass rose look on the chart for a circle about five inches in diameter that contains the 360 degrees of the compass. 360 degrees, that's a big deal in the Navy, it's a big deal on the Earth. Our Earth is 360 degrees around. Everything we do in navigation is involving the 360 degrees. That helps us figure out where we are. When we come in and out of port now, we'll mark down all of the objects on the land that we can see. So look at the land side, you'll see A, B, C, D, E, F. Those are the high points that we're going to use with the compass rows to cross on our track line and you'll see little small X's. That's keeping us on track as we move in and out of the port. Now when we head out to sea, guess what happens? We take this chart away and we've got another chart where we're heading and it's all white. There's nothing around us but deep water. We know where we're going. If you look up on the bulkhead over here, that red arrow says we're going course 255 from San Diego. That'll take me right into Pearl Harbor in four days. I like that. <laughs> and up on the right side, you can see the knot meter. We're steaming along at 18 knots. That's 20 miles an hour. And at a 24 hour day, that'll push us down the track 500 miles. Very, very good on the gas per miles. So that's how we did it. Now, what we would do is use our compass rose, course 255, a transparent ruler, and a very highly scientific yellow number two pencil, and trace ourselves right across the chart. And we run off one chart, we keep going on the next chart. And, and that was pretty accurate, except that we had to do some checking a couple times a day. At exactly high noon, we check our clocks. We had two clocks running on Midway, First clock was Greenwich Mean Time. That's the prime meridian. You remember when Mary Old England ran the world in the Royal Navy? So they set up Greenwich Mean Time. So all Navy ships keep that clock going. And then we keep our local hour clock going. 
And here in San Diego, we're eight hours west for a plus sign of eight hours. So we're eight hours west. So that would give us, with some math, gives us a longitudinal line which runs north and south. We also would use the sexton in the case, and here's a picture of the sexton, to measure the angle of the water up to the sun. The sunlight at noon will give us our our declination down from the sun to our latitude line and so we have latitude and longitude. The last thing we would do is twilight after sunset and twilight before dawn we can go looking for some other things. Some people look for planets there's four of them that are big deal operative but they change with the seasons so I like stars better if the Navy uses stars. There's some 5,000 stars out there the Navy uses a hundred of them or so. Midway we used about five or six very popular stars. Uh, Cabela, Betelgeuse, Alturus. Uh, we'd also go looking for the, the friendliest guy, the friend of Santa Claus. Remember the Big Dipper? And then the Little Dipper, and at the end of the Little Dipper ladle right over the North Pole is the North Star. North Star is the brightest star up there, and she doesn't move at all. She's parked right over the North, the North Pole. So we measure that, and that immediately gives us our latitude, and then we use three or four other stars, which will precisely give us our longitude. Okay. Then about 1988, if you look back there, to the left of the safe came our GPS system. GPS is Global P Positioning Satellite, and all that really is is the satellites take the place of the stars. The good news about GPS is it's real time, second to second. When we're reading the stars, we have almanacs, we have tables, we have math we have to do. It takes us about 25 minutes to figure out where we are when we're shooting the stars. Meanwhile, we've gone down the track about another 15 miles, so we're not precisely where we think we are. GPS tells us exactly where we are. Okay, we're going to leave here, go up to the bridge. Up there, let me lead you, wait for me. Uh, up there, there's big chairs. So if you see a big chair sitting, it will be very important. <laughs> there's a steering wheel and a gas pedal so if you're real smart you can find that and then I'll show you what I did in 1965 <laughs> <laughs> this Midway Bridge complex and I say complex because it's really three pieces of architecture. The center section in here was the original bridge in 1945 and they immediately realized it was way too small. So they added on auxiliary con out here and they also added on uh, auxiliary con out on the starboard side. Out on the starboard side is where we would go to give the orders to bring the ship away from the pier. The reason is we could see down to the dock. We'd also go there to bring the ship back to the pier. The other thing we did is go to Costco. Uh -huh. Look at the picture on the back wall back there. You can see the Midway on the left and the Costco ship in the middle. I'm only kidding. It's not a Costco ship. It's a Navy supply ship. And that, that ship has all the fuel we need for the ship, fuel for the airplanes, and more importantly, fuel for the crew. The crew, 4,400 young people, average age of 21. We work 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, around the clock. So guess what? We ate 15 tons of food every day, 13,000 meals every day. Are you ready for this next one? Going grocery shopping for this? 1,000 dozen eggs every day. 
1,000 gallons of milk and all the ice cream we could get our hands on. Okay, the center section is the pilot house, and this is the helm. I need a helmsman. Son, can you be my helmsman? Put your hands on the wheel. There you are. Okay, there's your hand. There's the helmsman of the midway. He is steering the ship. Now, notice where the steering wheel is. It's not up on the windshield. It's back here, and we don't want him looking out of the windshield. We want him focusing on his gyro compass and his backup gyro, his rudder angle. And the order I would give the helmsman would sound like this. Helmsman, come right five degrees to course 270, and he would turn the ship to the right and bring me to course 270. And then come over here. Over here, this is the gas pedal. Okay, face it, turn around. And this is called the engine order telegraph. And so what we would be doing is sending all the orders down to the two, four big engine rooms. And the faster we tell them to go, they'll add more steam, the slower they'll take off steam. So my order to you would be all engines ahead, standard speed. Can you set me up with standard speed? Standard, good, over there, standard, perfect, very good, super job, okay. And the last important person here would be this young lady behind the board, right over here, she's writing on the board backwards, and her job is to write down all the ships around us on the sea. What we're doing is tracking their course and speed, we know our course and speed. The big thing we were worried about was running into another ship, so we're always tracking who's around us, okay? Out here on the outer navigation bridge, we have five very important people. Let's see who's out here. The most important is over here. Raise your hand, young man. There's the captain of the midway right there. Look at him. Dude, super captain. 45 years old. He's sitting in the left-hand seat chair. And the starboard chair is the navigator. Raise your hand, navigator. There's the navigator. He was very important for us because he's the one that certified us to stand the watch. We had other jobs on the ship. We stood the watch for four hours at a time. Navigator sort of had the personality of an assistant high school principal. So kind of always checking out us. The three officers that would be up here would be this young man, junior officer of the watch, raise your hand, 21 years old, there he is right there. The next level would be this young man, 22 years old, junior officer of the deck, and over here, young lady, Stand right here. Here she is, 23 years old, the officer of the deck, okay? Now, if you're driving the ship, you'd stand right here, and this is your instrument panel like you're driving a big bus, okay? Now, <laughs> you don't have a steering wheel or a gas pedal, though. It's back here. Back there, right? So what you're going to do, stay this way, and you're going to give the orders with your voice to the steering and to the speed, okay? All right? And this is the job I did in 1965 on Midway when I was 23 years old. So thanks for coming on my little tour today. I enjoyed being 23 again. Thank you very much. Right there, it's hard to see from back here. 
You can come up and look if you want. It's cool. Yeah. Well, you're in the front row. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I did. Let's go to the next one. Here it is. Run it out. So every hundred landings, let's say on this wire, they keep track of how many landings are made on each wire. Every hundred wire landings, they change the wire. Okay. They'll take it. I don't know what they do with them now, but in the old days, they just throw them. Okay. Every, let me, okay, I want to go back, see if I can find that. Okay, this is, see this, this is the tail hook, this is what catches the wire. Every 10 landings, they change that. The guys in the squadrons, they change that, they keep track of that too. Now, what happens if they have, what, what do you think ha would happen to that tail hook if you had a bolter? running across the deck. It gets chewed up, it gets gashed, it gets ground down. It's like you put a grinder on it. So they'll check it, and if they need to, they'll change it out right away. Usually you have to, they usually have to change them out right away. That takes about, that's about a 10 minute job. Okay, so this is, look at the cameras in back of the pilot here. We're looking at, this is called an indexer, AOA indexer here. It's telling us you got these three chevrons here. This here is telling us we're too high. This one's telling us we're optimum, we're right on the glide slope where we're supposed to be. And this is telling us we're too low, we're going too fast. So they're aiming for this. And the LSO sees what the pilot sees. Because if you look at the F-18 over here, look at the, see the, the, the taxi light up there? Just below it, you see the three little dots to the right, right of it? That, uh, that is the AOA index device. So the, 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 the LSO sees those. So he's seeing the same thing the pilot sees. And that, that's one of the systems I worked on when I worked on airplanes and everything. We were always had to go, go out there and adjust everything to make sure it's right. Now, let's think about this. These are sophisticated aircraft. You got sophisticated equipment to, to check everything, to test everything, to make everything right. The way we adjusted this, on the airplane I worked on, which was right up there, the A7, on here, they had this piece of metal that you attached to the side of the aircraft. They had another piece of metal that went over the AOA transducer that went over. It's called angle of attack transducer. And they, we took a piece of dental floss, tied it from one end to the other end with a spring between them. And that's how we did it. And it worked fine. It probably cost $10,000 for, for that little spring back in the day. And over here, you can see here, you can see over here, you can see the Fresnel lens. Here he comes, he's flying by the plane. So when they come in, they get into martial pattern. They, they will come in, they'll, get, they'll come back from their mission. They'll come around on the port side here, fly by the plane, fly by the plane, fly by the ship, bank to the left in front, come around, get into the pattern and land. They're gonna take the plane that has the lowest amount of fuel first. Real important, real, and then seven, when they're, when they're in their pattern, the next plane will be be in the pattern, 17 seconds behind them, come in behind them, the same thing. And we land one every 45 seconds. So that looks pretty cool. So he's coming in. Yeah, and after you've seen it a hundred times, you're like, oh, I don't care anymore. I don't, I don't care, I'm not gonna go up and watch flight arms, it's like flying. Coming in behind the boat. He's gonna catch the wire. When he gets into the pattern, he's gonna lower his tail hook. He's gonna lower his flaps. He's gonna lower his landing gear. There he is coming in landing. Pretty good, almost right on, right on center line. That's what you want. Pretty good. And I always used to think pilots were painted the butt, you know, real big heads, big egos. But now I kind of get why. 
<laughs> what they're doing is pretty, pretty intense. Here's the E2 coming in, and the distance between the deck and the tail hook, on, depending on the plane, can be different. As long as they're in that optimum glide slope, three and a half degrees, everything is fine. This is the LSO platform up here, out over here. This is actually the Midway here, back in the day. This is back in the, could be in the 70s or early 80s. In fact, I might be standing right over here. My shop is right over here. And you see again, this is on the wrong side of the foul line, so we had a foul deck. Here we are again. Pretty cool landing. All right. Now, 30% of our landings are at night. This is what the pilot sees at night when he's coming in to land. Pretty scary. So he's relying on his instruments and everything to get him in, get him down correctly. Yeah, that's the hardest for the pilots is landing at night. Yeah, we're showing another one. Just coming in again. That's from the back seat of F-18. Gives thumbs up. Everything's good. You come in. They land, and they're gonna, they're gonna tell. The troubleshooters for that squadron, the pilot's going to give them a thumbs up, either the plane is up or down, because it's going to go out on another mission probably. If it's down, we got to fix it. If it's not, if it's down, if we can't fix it, we got to get another plane in, in to take its place. So. There's the, the runner there, he's going to disconnect the tail hook from the wire from the tail hook. Now, little things that happened on here when I was on here, serving on the midway. So, like my shop was right over here, over there, and one guy, that guy come running the shop said, you hear that, Larry? I said, what? You hear that plane landed wheels up on the flight deck? No. And the big A3 right back there was that type of plane. It caught the wire with its wheels on. <laughs> Sitting on its belly right here. Wow. Like, what the hell? What happened? Don't no, ever never find out. No, no. But then a few months later, the same plane, the same pilot, landed way right of the center line here. And on the other side of the foul line, there were three helicopters wing went right through all three of them. Wiped out a whole detachment of big, the squadron was called Big Mother. They were rescue helicopters in Vietnam. And then, and I'm, Ver, I don't know, Vern probably wasn't here then. What, what year did you come on board? 73. So in 72, I always like to tell the horror stories. In A6, A6, where's the A6 at? Okay, it's up on the catapult. If you can go up here and listen to the catapult talk. A6 coming in at night, landing. Because nothing goes bad in daytime, it's always at night. Comes in and lands. It's right main mount, breaks. So it comes in and hits the deck and it goes like this. It goes like this. And the tail hook missed the wires. So it slid all the way up where planes are parked on the bow. That's where we parked them when we brought them in. Yeah, it was really... Really nasty, that's as far as I'm going to go with that. Another landing. There's, see, the, see the difference between day and night? Pretty scary. I remember I was working on a plane. I had to change out the gyro for the, for the, for the heading, the attitude and all that. And the pilot was coming up, it was, it was about dusk. And he says, is this, is this airplane fixed? I said, I ain't think so. He grabbed me by the neck. Like as a little kid walked me up to the front of the boat and says, I want you to go like I want you to go like this and look out there. 
It's like, okay, what, what am I supposed to see? What do you see? I don't see anything. That's what I see when I launch off the craft ship. I don't see anything. So is it working? <laughs> and it was. Here, this is some real landings. in 1975 it was the end of the Vietnam War and we were ordered to take part in the evacuation of Saigon. It was a large evacuation of close to 100,000 people right at the end of the war. It was called Florida and is still there today in a beautiful display of Mount Rico. And now, the best part of this story I think is this. This is the most dangerous 30 hours I've ever seen on a carrier. Many of these helicopters coming aboard were running out of fuel. If one of them would have flamed out and crashed on a flight deck with the number of people we had on the deck at any one time, boy, a lot of people would have lost their lives. I'm not here to tell you we did not lose one person. And I'm also here to tell you, and I sincerely believe this, God was with us during those very dangerous hours. Thank you for listening to the story. Operation Hãy subscribe cho kênh Ghiền Mì Gõ Để không bỏ lỡ những video hấp dẫn